Okay. It's two o'clock. So I know that we're going to have a really rich discussion. So we want to jump right into it. Um, thank you all for coming today and attending this special briefing from uh, the Housing Services Resource Center and our partners um, from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development on some exciting new guidance they recently released related to the mainstream vouchers. Um, so today you're going to hear um, directly from HUD uh, about their updated guidance and also have an opportunity to engage in discussion and ask your questions directly. Um, so we're really excited about it. Next slide, please. I am Ryan Elza, and I'll be helping to facilitate our conversation today, and I'm the Interagency Housing Innovation and Strategy Lead for ACL. Next slide. Um, just a couple housekeeping uh, notes for today's discussion. You can connect your audio through the computer or using the dial-in option that was provided in the registration email. Uh, we also hope that today's conversation is really active, so please use the chat throughout the webinar, especially for your comments or to connect with other participants. And we ask that you um, submit your questions via the chat or the ask a question function, and we'll be sure to try to get to as many questions as we can today. Also, once we get through um, the uh, briefing from our partners at HUD, we'll also provide an opportunity for folks to be able to raise your hand and unmute yourselves and ask your um, questions directly. So we look forward to that part of the conversation. Next slide. Um, and a few notes on accessibility, we will have ASL uh, interpreters pinned throughout the entire uh, meeting. And to enlarge the view of the interpreter, you can click on their window and select the pin icon to maximize your view. For screen readers, use uh, users, if you'd like to reduce the unwanted chatter, you can request uh, speech on demand by hitting the insert key, spacebar, and the letter S on your keyboard. Next slide. And uh, today's, uh, uh, we're gonna do a quick poll because we wanna um, know a little bit more about who's on today's meeting. Um, so the question is, what is your primary sector? And your response options are Medicaid, health, healthcare, non-Medicaid, housing, homelessness, disability, and or aging, human and social services, not including the above, community development, association, advocacy, philanthropic education or research, organization, consumer, or other. So we'll just take a minute for folks to be able to respond. And I see folks are also dropping your organization and information in the chat, which is great as well. So let's go ahead and see the results from the poll. Awesome. So we have a uh, diversity of folks here, but a lot of folks from housing and homelessness and the disability and aging uh, and Medicaid. So excited to have all of you and your expertise here today with us. Uh, next slide. So this uh, webinar is brought to you from the Housing Services Resource Center, which was launched as a partnership between HHS and HUD in um, 2021. And the HSRC fosters cross-sector partnerships between organizations and systems that provide housing resources and homelessness services healthcare and mental health services, independent living services, and other supportive services. And we're really excited to be partnering today with our colleagues at HUD for this uh, special opportunity. Uh, next slide. We also want to make sure folks are aware about our upcoming three-part Housing and Services Partnership Accelerator uh, webinar series, um, which will kick off this Wednesday and will provide best practices and lessons learned from each of the states participating in our 2024 cohort. Um, and uh, the Housing Services Partnership Accelerator, which is a housing, uh, which is a 12 month technical assistance opportunity for qualifying states providing housing related supports and services. Um, so we're dropping those links in the chat, but hope that all of you are able to join you, join us for those webinars. Um, and with that, I'm going to next slide and the next slide we will go to our presenters. Um, so I would love to introduce uh, our uh, colleagues at HUD. So first we'll hear some opening remarks from Dr. Richard Cho, who's the Senior Advisor for Housing and Services in the Office of the Secretary at HUD, who has championed much of this work in his tenure at HUD. And then we'll have a brief presentation from Emily Warren, a Senior Housing Program Specialist at HUD, who will explain the changes to the mainstream voucher program um, that was released last week. And once the presentation has concluded, we will take questions from the audience and whatever, whatever time we have available. And please remember to drop your questions in the Q&A function. And let's not waste any more time. And I'll turn it over to Richard. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, and really 
wonderful to see so many people joining uh, this um, briefing on um, our mainstream voucher uh, flexibilities. Um, I really want to just um, stay here um, how much I'm excited uh, to be able to share with you um, that HUD has been able to um, create new flexibilities for our mainstream voucher program. And uh, my colleague, Emily Warren, is going to actually do a lot of the uh, presenting on what uh, these flexibilities are. Uh, but what I want to say is that um, HUD um, operates a number of different housing voucher programs. Um, folks here who may or may not be familiar with their voucher programs know that um, HUD um, provides um, housing choice vouchers across the country, um, which are um, sometimes referred to as Section 8 vouchers. Um, that is our primary sort of rental assistance that we provide to low-income um, households across the nation to be able to afford rent um, on the private market um, and, and to find um, housing that they can afford. And, and those vouchers essentially um, help subsidize the difference between 30% of the household's um, income and the rent that's charged. And so it, it's a really vital tool to be able to assist many low-income uh, families and households uh, to be able to afford um, um, housing. Now, um, of those voucher programs, uh, we have a number of programs that are specifically targeted to certain populations and where the expectation is that um, in addition to the voucher assistance that they receive, um, the household is also going to be receiving supportive services. Um, we have, for example, uh, a voucher program specifically uh, to address homelessness among veterans known as the HUD VA Supportive Housing Program or HUD VASH vouchers. Um, and the, the HUD VASH vouchers is in many ways the kind of model for how we'd like um, many of our special purpose vouchers to operate where um, there is a clear partner who makes referrals of the uh, of the people who receive those vouchers um, and is also responsible for providing supportive services um, alongside those vouchers to help um, people um, not only find housing once they've received a voucher um, but also enter that housing and then to provide ongoing um, supportive services um, case management um, tenancy sustaining services to the household or individual um, so that they can um, stay stably housed um, and um, uh, uh, uphold their obligations as a tenant, um, support activities of daily living, uh, and also use that housing as a platform for achieving all of their other goals. Now, one of the voucher special purpose voucher programs that we have are called mainstream vouchers. Um, Emily will talk more about um, how these came to be, but these are essentially vouchers specifically targeted to people with disabilities. Um, I often have thought of mainstream vouchers as um, community living vouchers or Olmstead vouchers. Um, they are um, vouchers that were specifically intended to support the goals of Olmstead, which is to help people with disabilities to live in the community in integrated settings uh, and have um, opportunities to uh, lead a fully integrated life. Um, mainstream vouchers, like the HUD VASH program, um, are expected to involve partnerships between a number of agencies that support community living. That includes Medicaid, uh, Medicaid Money Falls the Person programs. That includes Centers for Independent Living um, and all uh, um, disability um, agencies, um, as well as homelessness continues with care. In addition, um, the expectation is that the, the households are receiving assistance through the mainstream voucher, mainstream voucher program are also receiving um, housing-related supportive services, whether that's through Money Follows a Person or Medicaid Home and Community-Based Services, or in, many, in some cases, a Medicaid 1115 demonstration services, um, or other supports that are provided um, to people with um, disabilities um, or to people experiencing homelessness who have disabilities. Um, but until now, until recently, um, the mainstream vouchers um, weren't able to be actually operated fully in the way that supported those partnerships with both those referring agencies as well as the agencies that can provide supportive services. Um, however, um, in the um, uh, fiscal year 24, um, federal budget, HUD asked Congress for some flexibilities to be able to uh, um, provide um, the public housing authorities that administer mainstream vouchers to have some uh, additional flexibilities that would enable them to better strengthen those partnerships with the agencies that can help refer people with disabilities who are either transitioning from institutional settings or homelessness, um, as well as to provide ongoing supportive services. Um, we are pleased that Congress in their um, FY24 um, HUD budget did include those waiver authorities um, and just a few weeks ago, um, HUD issued a notice that um, uh, really outlined some policy changes and some optional flexibilities for the mainstream voucher program that we believe will help strengthen the partnerships between the um, many um, thousands of public housing authorities across the country who administer mainstream vouchers uh, and the various agencies that support community living. Again, Medicaid, Money Falls the Person, Centers for Independent Living.
go on and on. Um, but what we're really hoping um, that these flexibilities will do um, is really un unleash a new wave of, of stronger partnerships between those um, uh, uh, healthcare and disability agencies um, and public housing authorities so that we can support um, more people with disabilities to live uh, in community living, uh, in community settings, as opposed to institutions or homelessness. Um, so uh, I'll be here um, to help answer any questions at the end, but with that, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Emily Warren, who's really instrumental in helping craft these new flexibilities and policy changes. Emily, take it away. Thanks, Richard. Um, so um, I work in the voucher policy office here at HUD on some of our special purpose voucher programs. Um, and if you could bring up the slides. Awesome, thanks. Uh, if you could go forward one slide. Thank you. So uh, before I talk about the notice that Richard mentioned, I first just want to go over just a few uh, basics about the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So I'm sure for some of you, this is a review, but just um, for some context, and then I'll talk about the, I'll spend the bulk of my time talking about the mainstream uh, notice. Uh, so first, uh, just as a review, uh, so uh, an, a Housing Choice Voucher is a housing subsidy for participants who then go and use that subsidy uh, in the private rental market. And these vouchers are federally funded through annual appropriations, and they're administered at the local level by approximately 2,200 uh, public housing agencies or PHAs. And while most vouchers are tenant-based, there are project-based vouchers where the subsidy is tied to the unit, including um, some uh, project-based mainstream vouchers. And families typically pay 30% of their gross income towards rent in the HCV program. And then the remainder is paid by the PHA uh, directly to the landlord. Next slide. And just to be clear on what HCV is and is not, since it goes by a lot of names. Um, so the names on the left are all uh, different names that you might've heard of for the HCV program, probably not as commonly known as housing certificates anymore, since that was before the, the uh, creation of HCVs, which I believe were coming up on the 50th anniversary. Um, and then those programs on the right are, are other um, housing assistance programs. Uh, next slide. And so we have what we call regular vouchers or regular housing choice vouchers. And then we have um, several of what we call SPVs or special purpose vouchers. So these operate like HCVs and that the voucher holder is paying 30% of their gross income towards rent. And most of the other rules are the same, except there are special um, eligibility criteria, uh, most importantly. And so um, you may have heard of some of these. Richard mentioned hud -Vash. Uh, which has the built-in case management component. And then today we'll be talking about mainstream vouchers. There are about 70,000 mainstream vouchers na nationally. Um, and there is a public facing dashboard that you can look at to see what percentage of any voucher type is being utilized in your community. So I can put a link to that in the chat. Uh, next slide. So just uh, uh, this is just mostly as a reminder that um, Mainstream serves uh, people with disabilities, and that is a big proportion of the population served by housing choice vouchers. So uh, if you look at the yellow piece of the pie, um, a lot of those families are served by mainstream and by the more sort of legacy um, program NED, which stands for non-elderly disabled. And then a lot of other uh, families that include a person with a disability are served in that in the red in the 30% uh, proportion. For about 5 million people uh, nationally and in, in a, almost 2.5 million households. Next slide. So just a little bit more about how the program works. So HUD, uh, HUD's relationship with the, with the PHA is governed by the ACC or Annual Contributions Contract, which lays out how many vouchers they have available to um, use. And then the... Um, the PHA uh, subsidizes the tenant's um, housing through the voucher, and then the tenant's uh, relationship with the landlord is governed by the lease. And then the PHA uh, 
subsidizes the um, tenant's rent through the HAP, which stands for the Housing Assistance Payment. So together, the voucher and the HAP total the total rent amount. Next slide. And this is just a, a general, um, an overview of the process uh, between application to issuance, which will be important when we talk about the mainstream notice. So first the family applies and is placed on the waiting list. And then the PHA um, selects the family from the waiting list. Um, and then the PHA determines uh, whether the family is eligible based on income and other factors. And then the PHA issues the family their voucher um, and provides them with a specific amount of time to use that voucher to find a unit. And they provide a briefing where they go over a lot of different information about how the program works. Those two things usually happen concurrently. And then the family goes out and searches for a unit on the private market. And then hopefully the family finds a unit. And then there are some other steps after that, but this is just to kind of show from application to issuance. Uh, next slide. So let me talk a little bit. So uh, just give a brief overview of mainstream before I talk about the notice. Um, so the first mainstream vouchers were awarded back in 1997. And then the Frank Melville Act of 2010 converted mainstream to the regular housing choice voucher program. And to be eligible for mainstream, the family must have a person 18 years of age or older and less, uh, and less than 62 years of age. But other than that eligibility requirement, mainstream vouchers follow the, follow the same program policies as the regular housing choice voucher program. Next slide. Um, and so mainstream has received uh, quite an influx of funding over the last decade or so. Uh, so this is just to highlight how the program has grown. Um, and this, so the, um, the left axis is showing um, utilization. So ideally we're at 100% utilization. Um, so that's the percentage of vouchers that are being used. Uh, and the denominator is the number of vouchers, the total number of vouchers that the PHA has available to them through their annual contributions contract. And then, so we started in 2015 nationally with just under 15,000 mainstream vouchers. And then those uh, numbers with the plus signs kind of in the middle show um, some of the, the big awards that we've made over the last uh, six years. And then, so now nationally, we're at about 71,000 uh, vouchers um, in total. Next slide. So back to this slide where we talked about the, um, the process from application to issuance. Um, and these are, I'm gonna just briefly talk about some of the challenges that uh, PHAs were having with mainstream administration and how the notice is intended to help address some of those. So because mainstream families had to come off of the HCV waiting list, PHAs that had really long waiting lists, um, or if they had a specific preference, let's say for um, people exiting institutions, it could be really hard to find an el eligible applicant on the waiting list. Um, so they, PHAs have often struggled with identifying mainstream ap eligible applicants, especially if they want to prioritize a certain subpopulation of applicants. And we also heard from PHAs that mainstream applicants can really struggle to complete the application. Um, so um, with, um, we're here where it says the PHA determines the family's eligibility. Um, if you've ever, uh, if you're if you're familiar at all with the uh, process for uh, applying to the HCV program, there's a lot of documentation that you need to collect. So that's uh, a place where, for example, Richard mentioned HUD VASH and the case management component. Component that's when it's really helpful to have a built-in case management component, right? Because then you have a case manager, or social worker who can help you gather all that documentation, and then. Um, so the PHA issues the family a voucher and provides a briefing. As I mentioned, the family receives a lot of information in that briefing. And that is the only time where they learn or they're told uh, how long they have to search. So what their search time is. Um, and, P and P 
PhDs were, were required to give a minimum of 60 days search time. Um, and that's also when they find out when their voucher would expire and then what process uh, the PHA has for requesting more search time. And then, um, so families uh, do struggle both in the regular HCV program and then also in mainstream with finding a unit. So there's lots of reasons, right, why mainstream families might struggle with securing a unit. Um, maybe they need a unit with specific accessibility features. They need a unit located near medical services. Um, there's lots of, of possible reasons. Um, and then ultimately, here at the end, we have the Family Maintains Housing Stability, which is ultimately um, the uh, final outcome related to the program. Um, but we know that some families really need ongoing case management, supportive services, things like landlord tenant mediation, or um, if there's any health issues that are threatening their tenancy. Um, so, uh, so for example, when we hear about is like behavioral health and health issues. So um, since there's not that built in case management component, component, having a PHA, having a relationship with a service provider who is able to provide services like that can be really key. Uh, next slide. And I'll just talk a little bit about search time and success rates, which is kind of how we measure um, how, uh, how successful families are being able to use their voucher. So when we talk about search time, that is the time between when the family is issued that voucher and when they lease up. And median search time for mainstream families is 61 days. Um, so keep in mind that the minimum search time they're given is 60 days. And uh, the 61 days, if it, it's that's the median, right? So there's families that take less and families that take more time. And that varies really widely by uh, housing market. And then also we look at what percentage of applicants are able to successfully use their voucher. And for mainstream applicants, 60% are able to use it within 180 days nationally. And we use the 180 days metric because typically if a family is going to be successful, they're going to be successful within 180 days. Uh, next slide. And this is just showing mainstream uh, in red compared to the other, some of our other special purpose voucher programs. So you can see HUD VASH on the far right has the highest number of successful issuances, uh, which could likely at least partially be contributed to the fact that they have the case management component. Um, and then mainstream is further down there, um, like I said, right at, at around 60%. Next slide. So Richard mentioned the statutory language that we received to the 24 uh, budget. So this is what we're relying on to uh, provide uh, both some alternative requirements for PHAs as well as some optional waivers. Next slide. So we can put a link to the notice in the chat, but um, this, uh, this notice applies to all PHAs that are administering mainstream vouchers. It does not apply to NED and it was effective upon publication um, and we are giving PHAs 120 days to adopt the alternative requirements in the notice. If they choose to adopt any of the discretionary policies, they're free to do that anytime. Next slide. So these are the mandatory policies first. Um, so instead of a minimum of 60 days, we're requiring that PHAs provide mainstream applicants with at least a 120 day initial search term. Um, because as I mentioned, the median 60 days um, search time is what we're seeing. Um, so a lot of families just need additional time before, before they um, request an extension. Next slide. So uh, PHAs have a lot of discretion in how they design a, a, their, uh, a policy for requesting extensions. And we wanted to simplify this and provide uh, mainstream applicants with more time. So um, they have to approve the initial extension request. It has to be for 90 days. So that means that the family has 120 days to search. And if they receive an extension, they have an additional guaranteed uh, 90 days. So that's 210 days um, to search essentially guaranteed. Um, 
And also, um, I mentioned that briefing where the family gets a lot of information. Um, the PHA must also notify the family on at least one occasion after that briefing and remind them of when their search term expires and how they request an extension. So the hope here is that this, this is more transparent um, and uh, makes it just easier for families to request more time if they need it. Uh, next slide. Let's see, and um, so this process doesn't touch the reasonable accommodation process, which is a separate process. This only requests the um, extension request policy that's available to any family. Um, next slide. And then also the final mandatory policy is um, a lot of PHAs have residency preferences. Um, PHAs can have a lot of different preferences, which I didn't get into uh, much today, but happy to answer questions about. Um, and so what this means is that a, a PHA um, will uh, prioritize um, applicants that are living within their jurisdiction. So through this notice, PHAs cannot apply any residency preferences to mainstream applicants. Um, the thinking here is that mainstream applicants who are experiencing homelessness or perhaps residing in an institution might be doing so out of the PHA's jurisdiction. Next slide. So we have two discretionary policies. I know this is also where um, Richard can jump in and provide um, some examples about how this is might be beneficial to you all. Um, so uh, PHAs now have the ability to adopt or establish separate mainstream waiting lists and preferences. So PHAs have to inform um, families on their current HCV waiting list about how to go about getting on a new mainstream waiting list. There's a lot of information in the notice about that. Um, it doesn't affect if a family joins the new mainstream waiting list, it doesn't affect their status on the uh, HCV waiting list. There's a lot of, uh, it's pretty common for families to be on multiple waiting lists at one PHA. Um, but this is this is exciting because it's going to make it a lot easier uh, for PHAs to prioritize um, certain uh, groups that are eligible for mainstream. It's just going to be easier uh, for them to identify eligible applicants uh, that meet the, uh, the sp specific criteria that they're looking for. Next slide. Actually, and Emily, I'll, since you invoked me, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. just um, share a little example about why that separate waiting list is important. So many of you may have already partnered with your housing authority um, to try to make mainstream vouchers um, available for um, the, the populations that you're trying to help transition from uh, either Medicaid funded institutional setting or um, homelessness or some or something else. Um, uh, those individuals would actually be added to the overall housing choice voucher waiting list, which I've seen in the chat. And, and so many of you know, these these waiting lists can be thousands of people long. Um, they can be many years long. Um, and so somebody who is eligible for a mainstream voucher would be um, essentially kind of buried in that larger housing choice voucher wait list. And the housing authority would actually go through each um, of their uh, of the people on the wait list um, whenever there's a voucher that um, becomes available. And then they at that point, they'll Try to identify if they're actually mainstream eligible um, and then assist them, um, which made for a very kind of um, challenging and somewhat inefficient way to help identify and make these vouchers specifically um, serve people with disabilities. So having a separate wait list is, I think, the first step. Um, the second thing we'll, that Emily will talk about is the second part, um, but is the first step in, in, in ensuring that we can try to um, um, make mainstream vouchers much more specifically targeted to the populations that we think should have received priority for mainstream vouchers, which are people with disabilities who are transitioning from uh, or avoiding institutional settings or transitioning from homelessness or trying to avoid homelessness. Go ahead, Emily. Thanks. Uh, so the second piece of this is that PHAs could adopt separate mainstream preferences. And again, in the notice, it kind of it, uh, provides some guidance to PHAs, PHAs on the process that they should undertake to, to establish separate mainstream preferences. But um, essentially, um, and we also encourage PHAs in the notice to formalize partnerships with any uh, agencies that they're using as referral sources for these preferences uh, through an MOU. 
And um, we also note here that while PHAs must cumulatively serve people of all disability types, um, so people of all disability types must have equal access to mainstream vouchers, PHAs can accept uh, referrals, um, have a referral preference for an, um, from an agency that uh, specifically serves um, one, dis one disability type uh, or more. So, um, and we do remind PHAs that if they agree to adopt a preference as part of a NOFO application, which is pretty common, they should continue to have that preference. Uh, next slide. Actually, if you could just go to the next one. Thanks. So this is just an example of how this could work in practice from the perspective of the PHA. So this was taken from a PHA's administrative plan where they outline all of their policies. On the left list, so this PHA has a lot of different preferences. Um, and then it shows how much they're weighted, um, which is a pretty common um, preference system. And then on the right here, you see that the, um, if you look through um, this list here, it's clear that the PHA has executed an MOU with their with the agency that is the source of the referrals for this preference. And so they are explaining here that um, applicants that um, are, would be eligible for this preference are referred by this uh, provider. In this case, it's their continuum of care. And then also um, you can see through CDE that they've also outlined in that MOU the services that the uh, partner is responsible for, for providing uh, to those uh, applicants that meet that preference. So um, this is kind of an example of how this could work in practice. I don't know if you have anything to add on the preferences side, Richard. Yeah, so um, I think this is really what I think most of you may be most interested in, which is, um, you can now, um, if you can, and I don't know how many um, PHAs are on the uh, on this webinar, but if you are uh, if you are a partner uh, who has a, um, a populations that you want to be served through mainstream vouchers, you can speak with your public housing agency who has mainstream vouchers to see if they'll adopt a, a referral preference where they would essentially prioritize people referred by um, uh, one of your agencies, such as Medicaid, Medi uh, MFP program. Um, or a center for independent living or homelessness continuum of care, um, and combined with the separate waiting list, um, those re those um, referral preferences will essentially mean that um, people who are referred by one of those entities could become receive priority for those vouchers. Um, what that essentially would could mean is that um, we'll uh, instead of having to again um, use one single waiting list for the entire housing choice voucher program, and where people who are referred for mainstream vouchers are kind of um, buried. It's a little like a needle in a haystack problem. Uh, a PHA will now be able to better manage and ensure that they can um, prioritize people who are leaving institutional settings or homelessness who have disabilities um, and prioritize them, as well as be able to communicate more effectively with um, those referring um, partners uh, where people are on the waiting list um, so they can actually help um, uh, expedite that. I actually think um, this could also lead to um, shortening the wait list times for people who are referred by those entities um, for mainstream vouchers. Um, I know a growing number of states are starting to either use state funds or in some cases have approval from CMS to use Medicaid to cover um, up to six months of rental assistance. Um, also, money files the person can cover up to six months of rental assistance. And a lot of questions have come up about how do we make sure that um, that rental assistance provided is a bridge to a longer term um, source of rental assistance. Um, one of the ways that that uh, that could happen is is by adopt uh, having your housing authority adopt these preferences and and have a separate waiting list, which could help um, shorten the amount of time, um, which uh, would ensure that people are able to transition quickly from that bridge rental assistance source um, to uh, a long term uh, rental assistance um, uh, source such as mainstream vouchers. Thanks, Richard. Um, so that was the end of my slides. Um, if there are any um, questions we don't get to today, you can always send them to mainstreamvouchers at hud.gov. I can put that in the chat and I can turn it back over to Ryan for Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Emily. I think um, we can go down the questions that we have in the Q&A function. So I'll, I'll leave it to your and Richard's discretion about how you'd like to tackle the questions. 
Ryan, if you want to just go through them, we can we can kind of take them one at a time or let's do it. Um, so I'm gonna start from the most uh, earliest question. So how will the changes in this process affect those already eligible for mainstream project-based vouchers, which I think we've covered, but I'll let you all jump in. So um, if, if, if somebody, I think Emily covered this already, but as, if somebody is already on the um, overall housing choice voucher wait list, but is eligible for mainstream, um, our notice makes it clear that the housing authority who wants to adopt a separate waiting list as well as um, the separate preferences um, have to do um, adequate notification of people on the overall housing choice voucher wait list to make sure that they have the chance to be moved over to a separate um, mainstream voucher waiting list if that um, if that is what the PHA ends up doing. Um, in addition, um, the housing authority has to um, wait 60 days before starting to house anybody off the separate mainstream voucher wait list um, to ensure that they give adequate time for people who are already on the HCV wait list who are eligible for mainstream vouchers to be moved over to that separate waiting list. I think that answer, I'm, I think that answered the question. Thank you. Um, so a question from Eva. So units are apartment units or can it be used uh, as in a town home or is it always apartment units? Um, you can use a housing choice voucher in any unit that passes um, inspection standards. Um, HUD has, um, housing quality standards um, that uh, we're in the process of making a transition, but will soon become what are known as INSPIRE standards, which are um, national, physical, I can't remember the acronym, but um, I'll we'll put a link into the chat to what INSPIRE stands for. Um, but as any unit that meets those INSPIRE standards is eligible, it can be a townhome, it can be a single family home, it can be an apartment unit, um, but again, it has to meet those those quality standards. Great, thank you. And then are there lists with organizations who provide assistance with applications? Where can you fill out an application and by who? So each public housing authority or agency um, has their own um, application process. Many of them have it online as well as in paper form. Um, and so you, you would have to, and we, and we can put a link into the chat to how to find your local PHA, um, but they would have to apply through the PHA. Now, uh, there are a lot of agencies out there that provide assistance with um, filling out a voucher application as well as helping people navigate through the process. That's why I think it's really important that we are doing this work to try to strengthen these partnerships, because if you are a Medicaid Money Falls a Person program, if you are a Center for Independent Living, if you are a provider of supportive services that is funded under Medicaid to provide housing-related pre-tenancy supports, um, or if you're a, a homelessness um, uh, agency that is funded through the continuum of care, for example, you um, you can assist people to apply for vouchers and help them navigate that process. Um, and um, certainly uh, something uh, that you all can receive some uh, training and technical assistance on as well. But that is kind of what we're hoping to see. Um, I'll, I mentioned HUD VASH, and I, the reason why I mentioned HUD VASH is because I think in a way it, it is it kind of exemplifies what we see as the partnership between a supportive service provider. In that case, it's the the VA. Um, VA local medical centers have dedicated homeless program staff who help homeless veterans um, to um, be, you know, like apply for HUD VASH vouchers. They help them through the um, voucher um, processing, uh, 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 the voucher process. Um, they help um, once the veterans issued a voucher, they actually help them with housing search uh, and navigation with landlord um, engagement. Um, they help them uh, find um, uh, resources for furnishings, um, and they also um, uh, they help the veteran to move in and, and then ultimately provide ongoing case management to help the veteran stay housed. That is exactly the role that we're hoping that more MFP programs, more Centers for Independent Living, more COCs, um, and more um, Medicaid-funded supportive services agencies um, are going to be able to play. Um, so in many ways, we're trying to make mainstream vouchers a lot more like hud -Bash in the sense of the services partnerships, the refer referral partnerships, and the access to those ongoing supportive services. Great. Thank you. Um, a question from Amy. Do these new search times and extension requirements apply to all HCVs or just mainstream vouchers? This is just for mainstream vouchers. Great. Thank you. Um, and then who determines disability, particularly for people with behavioral dis health di disability? The PHAs have some discretion in how they verify disability status. 
but that should be, um, but a PHA should explain very clearly in their administrative plan how they verify a disability status. Typically, it's a, uh, it's a note or a letter from a, from a medical professional or some language kind of similar to that. Can families have one application to join different wait lists at the same time? So some PHAs do um, have a, a merged waiting list for different programs. It really, it really depends a lot on the PHA. Some PHAs, if they have a closed waiting list, will be accepting only pre-applications and the information that they collect on a pre-application is, pre is very limited. Um, just some basic demographic information. Um, so I know this is not a helpful answer, but it varies a lot by PHA. And then um, questions about the timeline. So did um, they hear correctly that there is no required timeline for PHAs to adopt any of the discretionary policies? Correct. They could choose to adopt the discretionary policies anytime. But and, go ahead. Ahead. Oh, I'll just note that um, any discretionary policies must be described in the PHA's administrative plan. So that might be why some PHAs take some time to adopt those policies as they need to go the pro to the process of updating their administrative plan. Can agencies like money follows the person partnership with PHAs and must PHAs uh, staff or most PHA staffs who don't know um, what the program is? Well, I think the answer is yes. Um, that is kind of our hope is that Money Falls the Person programs become one of the partners with PHAs. Um, if you're not already partnered, um, I think it'd be a really good idea to try to um, um, reach out to your local PHA and, and to, to build those partnerships. Um, uh, I think a real selling point for housing authorities is often, um, you know, are, are you able to bring supportive services to the population? Will you help them to be able to find housing? Uh, will you be able to help them maintain tenancy? Um, public housing authorities, um, their one of their kind of um, performance goals that they're always trying to strive for is higher utilization of their vouchers, meaning that they want more people to use their vouchers. Uh, they get um, kind of dinged a little bit for not having a lot of their vouchers under utilization. Um, and they also um, get measured in terms of how many people who are issued a voucher actually successfully find a housing unit. And so the degree to which you're able to provide supportive services to help people find a unit, um, that is a huge selling point. So if you're if you can explain what does money follows a person do, um, the fact that you can also not only provide assistance with housing search, but also you can use MFP um, programs to fund security deposits, um, uh, short term rental assistance, um, move in assistance, um, uh, household furnishings, things like that. So um, all of those are, are selling points to a housing authority because, again, their goal is to try to get as many people um, leased up into vouchers as well as um, they want to ensure that they're um, um, having successful tenants who and people who have case management and other housing tenancies sustaining services are definitely um, people that housing authorities would would view as um, you know that that that's definitely very attractive to PHAs. Thank you. Um, so we have a question related to uh, Medicaid. So would Medicaid rent through CMS approved waivers be considered a duplicate? Uh, benefit for someone with a voucher? Um, generally, no, because that rental assistance is supposed to end before HUD rental assistance begins. Um, the goal is to ensure non-duplication. Um, that Medicaid-funded short-term rental assistance, whether it's under an 1115 demonstration um, or by money falls a person, um, should should uh, like never um, overlap with um, HUD rental assistance. Um, if the uh, Medicaid um, program or MFP ends up um, paying the landlord um, uh, during an overlapping period with HUD um, housing vouchers, um, that is prohibited. So you can actually you cannot actually do that. If the Medicaid rental assistance is going to the the household themselves directly to pay for rent and do and overlaps with a period where they're assisted through a voucher, um, that additional money that is provided to that household would be counted as income. Um, and then would affect the amount of rental assistance they're receiving from HUD. Um, so generally, um, you want to avoid that. You really want to use any short-term rental assistance provided under MFP or under uh, a, a Medicaid-approved 11-15 demonstration 
um, as a, a bridge, as a, a transitional rental assistance that then um, uh, essentially converts to a housing choice voucher. I shouldn't use that term convert, but um, where where the rental assistance um, source um, changes from Medicaid or MFP to a housing voucher, such as mainstream vouchers. Thank you. And then this next question, I think, can build a little bit on that. So one of the highest barriers for families to utilize vouchers is the inability to obtain security deposits and meeting qualifications of having income two times the income ratio, two times the amount for the rent. People with disabilities receiving SSI and SSDI are receiving incomes of $948 a month to less than $2,000 per month. This income, when combined with the voucher income, rarely meets the ratio criteria that is required by landlords. Will there be a time when vouchers have funds available to access for security deposits and or a voucher to increase to align with the rental markets? Yeah, I don't know if Emily, you want to add a little bit to this, but I'll just say um, HUD has issued guidance clarifying that the administrative fees that we provide to public housing agencies, one of the eligible uses of those admin fees is to cover security deposits. That is an eligible use. That said, admin fees are not, um, you know, it's not like the PHAs receive a lot of funds in admin fees. So um, it is a trade off where they have to use those for that purpose, but they certainly can do so. Um, I know MFP, um, Money Files a Person, can also cover security deposits. Um, some states are receiving uh, approval from CMS under their 1115 demonstrations to cover security deposits um, as a transitional cost um, under Medicaid. Um, and then there are other um, state programs that can also um, provide security deposit assistance. But uh, Emily, I believe, I don't know if it, the vouchers themselves cannot cover security deposits, I believe. Right. So um I think the only thing I would add to that is we did award what we called extraordinary admin fees to PHAs with mainstream vouchers in 2022. And we're trying to monitor to the best of our ability what they're using those for because they could be used for things like security deposit assistance. But I think one of the reasons why we're excited about some of these partnership opportunities is we're hopeful that some of these partners can help identify resources for things like security deposit assistance when the PHA doesn't have um, funds available to cover something like that. Thank you. And then we have some a few questions related to are any of these vouchers for project-based units? We can clarify this in an FAQ, but I don't believe this notice would apply to PBVs because the um the the authority that we received in the budget specifically references tenant-based vouchers. Um but um, I'll, we will be putting out a, a mainstream FAQ to a company question or to cover questions that we've gotten about the notice, and and that that question will definitely be in there. Okay, thank you. Does removing the uh, residency preference change the policy uh, for not allowing portability for a year? Unfortunately, it does not. Um, so while PHAs cannot have residency preferences. Um, in mainstream, they can still restrict portability for non-residents uh, for the first year. So, no. And then um, we've gotten a lot of great questions around uh, partnership with entities um, such as SILs or other organizations. Um, so folks are really, uh, would love some great talking points, which I think, Richard, you kind of shared a little bit of the, the talking points um, that folks could use. Um, but a related question to that as well is, is it on the PHA to connect with organizations that can provide services and supports uh, like a SIL? Um, I think it should happen in all directions, to be honest. Um, I would hope that housing authorities um, have been already trying to partner with SILs and Medicaid and um, continues of care um, and other agencies that support community living in their states and communities. Um, but if they haven't, um, then I, I think it should uh, be on all of you as those agencies to reach out to your PHAs. Um, but the other thing I'll offer um, is that um, HUD's um, regional and field offices would always be um, willing to help broker those conversations. We've done that in a few states um, like North Carolina, like um, uh, in California, um, where we're, we're trying to help bring together PHAs who have mainstream vouchers and the various agencies that can become potential referral partners. So um, certainly, um, I'll we'll leave some contact information with you all to know um, how to reach out to our HUD field and regional offices. But this is something that we'll 
um, we're happy to to help um, make those connections. Uh, but again, don't hesitate. Um, reach out to your public housing agency. Explain who you are, what you do, and how you can help them with the utilization of mainstream vouchers. I think you'll definitely get some attention from at least most PHAs. And then can mainstream vouchers be used for private or shared units in assisted living or a similar non-medical institutional congregate setting that furnishes medical services and supports? That's a complicated one and one that we probably don't have time to cover on this call. Um, it is There's some tricky um, issues when you're trying to use any voucher program in, in assisted living um, or any license setting. Um, shared housing is also um, uh, possible with vouchers, but also requires some um, flexibilities uh, because the way the voucher program is supposed to work is typically uh, a, a household per um, apartment unit, but it's not impossible. And we certainly issued um, waivers on a case-by-case -case basis to allow that. Um, so probably uh, we'll need to follow up uh, with the, the person who asked that question separately. And then there's a follow-up question to the Medicaid question. Does this apply to someone who has arrears and needs supports to stay housed? And uh, this applies for someone who's already in housing. What was the sentence? So is, the, is this, I mean, in other words, can the mainstream voucher support somebody who already is in a home but then who needs rental assistance to stay in that home or who is owed back rent? So, Housing vouchers cannot pay rent arrears using the voucher program. If there's another source that can pay for those arrears, and then that individual and that unit both qualify for a voucher, whether it's mainstream vouchers or something else, it is possible to use a voucher in an existing apartment that somebody's already occupied. But um, and Emily, you should jump in if I'm incorrect here. But um, but that uh, household would need to be verified to be um, eligible. Um, and then they would have to be added to the wait list. So it may take some time um, before they uh, actually become their, uh, their a voucher becomes available to assist that household. That unit, that apartment unit also must meet the, the inspection standards that we mentioned. Emily, is that is that correct? Oh. And then uh, kind of building on that question, if someone is receiving rental assistance through a voucher, but it doesn't cover their full rent. If the Medicaid HRSN uh, dollars cover the gap in funding, that impacts the individual's income and also their voucher amount? It generally would not be a scenario where the rent is not fully covered by the voucher because a, a PHA would not enter into an, a, a housing assistance payment contract. That, that triangle graphic that Emily showed they would not actually enter into a housing assistance payment contract if the amount of rent that's charged is above what the payment standards are for that voucher. So um, housing authorities um, uh, have rent payment standards um, that are typically the fair market rent in some cases above that, where they have um, a, a flexibility to go above the fair market rent um, or where they're using something called rent reasonable in the standards. Um, and um, they would only enter into a, a contract with that landlord um, if the voucher plus 30% of the household's income would be able to cover that total rent. So uh, there's not really scenarios where a voucher, where the rent actually would go above that, um, that, that amount. So. Thank you. And then we're, we're going to keep uh, providing some clarification. Um, so this is from Lisa Sloan. Um, revisiting the question about short-term rental assistance from a Medicaid agency. If the Medicaid agency or MCO is paying rent for six months directly to the landlord, does that count as income when uh, PHA calculate the income for uh, the MS program? If it is short-term rental assistance, would the individual retain their homeless or institutionalization preference? And then are you worried individuals will over uh, income if these funds are counted? Okay, a lot, there's a lot in that question. Uh, first off, if somebody is homeless and then, then receives short-term Medicaid rental assistance to enter into a, an apartment, a permanent housing setting, they do not lose their homelessness status. They would be, it would be considered a permanent housing to permanent housing transfer. If, if for example, their long-term rental assistance becomes a voucher or uh, like permanent supportive housing rental assistance. 
Um, so people do not lose their homelessness status because they've entered homelessness so long as they were homeless prior to that short-term rental assistance. Um, if in the case where, uh, or, or rather with regard to the question of whether receiving uh, six months of rental assistance under Medicaid up to six months um, would be counted as income for that household, um, uh, no, as long as that is non-recurring. So if that um, rental assistance ends, um, then that is not considered um, income. So we we'll, housing authorities only look at income sources that are actually recurring. So if they're receiving rental assistance through another source, but it has an end date, um, at the point at which it ends, it's no longer considered income. So that person would be eligible um, for um, uh, a housing voucher or or that that rental assistance would not count towards their income for purposes of eligibility for the voucher program. I think that answered the questions. And I'd also remind folks, if you do want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand to ask a question. Um, so we've had a number of different questions related to the age restriction, and I know you answered that through the chat. Uh, Richard, uh, um, but did you want to speak a little bit more related to the um, folks being um, under the age of uh, <coughs> the restriction there? Sorry. Yeah, so um, I think, Emily, you should jump in if I'm incorrect here. I, uh, the, el the initial eligibility for admission to the mainstream voucher program is that you have to be um, six under the age of 62 and have a qualifying disability or a household that has a member that is under the age of 62 and has a qualifying disability. Um, that does not mean that upon your 62nd birthday that you then have to turn over, you have to, your voucher assistance ends, you you can remain in that that unit and receive the ongoing assistance. You just have to be six under the age of 62 at the point of admission to the voucher program. And that is actually baked into the statute of both um, the mainstream, uh, the authorizing um, legislation for mainstream vouchers, along with the Section 811 program, um, where that that's how um, eligibility for those units are. HUD has other housing assistance programs specifically for older adults, um, specifically the Section 202 program. Um, and frankly, the vast majority of people who receive voucher assistance, who live in public housing and who live in HUD multifamily housing programs are actually over the age of 62. So in a way, mainstream and NED vouchers we're, we're trying to, and, and also the 811 program was trying to meet a need of people who have disabilities who are not um, seniors. Um, and so uh, that is um, essentially why there is that age limitation. But Emily, am, did I get that right or wrong? Or? Yep. So I would just add that eligibility is only verified at the time of admission, right? So no one ages out of mainstream. Um, also, uh, sort of related, I saw a question about families versus individuals because I say, HUD has a habit of saying families when they just mean any household. So certainly many mainstream families is just one single person. Thank you. And then um, let's go to uh, Naya Jackson who has her hand raised. And so our my colleagues will request for you to unmute Naya and then you'll have to unmute yourself. And you'll give me the last question. <laughs> Might take a second. Oh, Naya doesn't have a question. Well, we're at the one minute out mark. So I'm just gonna, we can transition into wrap up. Um, so uh, there will be another opportunity for folks to learn more about um, the uh, release guidance. And that will be, if, yep, um, on September 25th. Um, that HUD will be leading from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern, and we're going to be dropping um, the link to that in the chat. And I would just, in, um, I want to thank again our colleagues at HUD for um, working with us to host this important conversation today and for releasing this uh, new guidance. Um, thank you to Richard and Emily, and um, we hope that you all have um, had the opportunity to really learn about this uh, new special guidance um, and all exciting possibilities that come along with it. Um, we'll be continuing to promote um, new guidance and information and technical assistance through the Housing and Services Resource Center. 
Um, so please do, um, you know, sign up for the Housing Services Resource Center's listserv so you can um, stay up to date. We have 20,000 um, uh, individuals uh, who have registered for our listserv and it's growing. Um, and we'd love to keep you updated about all the um, really great and exciting work that is happening. Um, so with that, um, thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of your Monday and week. And we look forward to um, visiting with you all again in the future. <laughs>